Tristan just said, my name is Hayes and uh, have the privilege of preaching this morning, especially want to welcome you if you're here visiting, uh, whether for the baptism or have come with a, a friend or a family member or just uh, local to the neighborhood and, and wandered, you were brave enough to wander into a church you, where you didn't know anybody, we're especially glad uh, to have you here. We have been this fall studying through Paul's letter to the Ephesians, and this morning we are right exactly in the middle of it. Uh, it's four, uh, I'm sorry, it's six chapters long, uh, and we have worked our way through the first three in the last uh, couple of weeks, couple months. Uh, and so this morning we are picking up at the beginning of chapter four. It's a significant transition in the book, in the letter that Paul wrote to the Ephesians uh, that has been passed down to us. In the first three chapters, just review after a, a, an introduction, a, a kind of introductory greeting, uh, Paul bears witness. He testifies to the Ephesians of what God has done through the work of Christ, not only to reconcile us, to unite us to Christ, but also in the process to unite us to one another, even across some of the most significant divisions that exist between people. And so that section is actually bookended on either side by prayer. Paul prays for the Ephesians. That's what we covered last week. And now from this point to the end of the letter, he is going to turn his attention to instructing the Ephesians and us in how we ought to live as a result of the things that he has taught in the first three chapters. In fact, the way he phrases it, you'll hear in a second, is how we ought to walk, how we ought to walk in a manner worthy of all the things that he has testified about in the first three chapters. And the principle that we get this morning in these six verses, you can make a good argument, is the principle that Paul spends the rest of the letter unfolding. Everything else he says from this point forward, in many ways, it kind of elaborates and specifies on what we are about to read. So if you would please turn your attention uh, to this text, just a few verses this morning. We're going to start in Ephesians 4, and we're going to read verses 1 through 6. Th this is what Paul says. I, therefore, a prisoner for the Lord, urge you to walk in a manner worthy of the calling to which you have been called with all humility and gentleness, with patience, bearing with one another in love, eager to maintain the unity of the spirit in the bond of peace. There is one body and one spirit, just as you were called to the one hope that belongs to your call, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all who is over all and through all and in all. Lord God, we thank you for your word. We thank you that you have given it to us for our good, that you have revealed yourself to us in it. And Lord, we pray that as we look at it this morning, that we would not just be more aware of what one leader in the church, the Apostle Paul, said to other Christians years and years ago, but that you would use these words by the power of your spirit to renew our own hearts. For some of us here this morning, that you would use them to draw us to you in a way that maybe we've never experienced before that some of us would find that our hearts come alive at the idea of experiencing a unity like Paul describes here. And Lord, for some of us who have known you a long time, we have to admit that our hearts often grow cold. And we pray this morning that you would use your word to breathe new life into our, our hearts. God, we pray in the process that we would find that we are being conformed more and more into the image of your Son in whose name we pray. Amen. Uh, so I think some of you that have been here week in and week out have caught on now. Over the last several weeks, more and more people have commented to me or asked me as we've worked our way through this book of Ephesians and as we neared closer and closer to the election, is it just coincidental that we're talking about these passages in Ephesians that focus so heavily on unity and reconciliation in a season in which there are forces at play, even within the church, that, that seem to want to pull us apart. And just to answer your question, no, it is not coincidental. <laughs> it is not the only reason that we have been looking at the book of Ephesians, but we were well aware of some of these dynamics that would be at play in our lives. This is not the first election most of us have lived through. And so it is intentional that we have looked at some of these themes. But I also want to assure you, some of you know if you've been at Ponce long enough, we are not nearly organized enough to line up this specific text with the Sunday after the election. That is way beyond us. 
we decided on Ephesians, we picked a date to start it and broke up the text. And this is where we happened to fall this morning. But I do want to say, as we go into this text, that our focus this morning is going to be the same as Paul's focus in this text, which is unity within the body of Christ, within the church. And there are important conversations to be had about national unity and unity in a, a polarized political system. That's not our primary focus this morning, though we will acknowledge those realities. It would be a bit naive to talk about the struggles of maintaining unity in the church without acknowledging what is going on around us. To that end, I don't know how you have processed the last several days since the election. I think for many of us, probably the safest and wisest option is just relief. <laughs> You're no longer being bombarded with the ads. Your phone is ringing less. And you can finally give more of your attention to other things. I confess that has not been the case for me. I tried to draw some uh, intentional barriers, some boundaries, so that I wouldn't get sucked into all of the election talk leading up to it. And I was at least fairly successful in that regard. But afterwards, it has just sucked me in. And it's not the first time I think after elections, it's fascinating. There's all this data. You can see the maps and how things are changing and everybody starts to kind of project. And, you know, what does this mean about the country? And what does this mean about where we're going? And one of the things that always becomes clear after an election, of course, is that we are not united in everything, right? And this has particularly, I think, become highlighted recently in the election cycles. It's not that many elections ago that we would go into a national election with a at least a decent idea of who would probably win. And at some point before the end of the very election day, one candidate would concede and they would talk a lot about the need for unity. And another candidate would acknowledge that they had won the election and they would talk about the need for unity and how they would, you know, work across the aisle and care for those who voted against them and things like that. I don't know about your experience, but I hear less of that talk in recent elections. Four years ago, of course, was a, a notable exception, but, but even now it can feel like we get less of that talk. And one of the things in particular that you notice after elections, I don't think just this one, but I've certainly picked up on it this week, is especially for the party, the side that loses, it's easy for there to be a lot of finger pointing. Why did this happen? And whose fault is it? Whose fault is it in leadership? And whose fault is it in the electorate? Is it possible for certain groups of people to actually work together, to want to be together, for their interests to be aligned. And I'm sure you've heard talk like this as well. One of the things that it illustrates for us, both nationally and within the church, because a lot of these things filter into our experience of the church as well, is that it can be very difficult to maintain a sense of unity when it feels like everything going on around us is fracturing. Like it's splintering, like people are pushing apart from one another. Talk about unity and maintaining unity can, um, can honestly feel even a bit tone deaf. It can it possibly even feel like it uh, doesn't hear the concerns of people who are hurting, who are confused, who don't feel like their interests are being taken into account. And so as we engage a text like this this morning, we have to acknowledge that those very same things can often happen within the church that it is far too easy for us to talk about unity in a kind of abstract way or in a way that makes it sound easy and in such a way that many of us can feel hurt by the very discussion, that we can feel like our interests are not being taken into account, that the, the difficulties that we experience are not being seriously considered. You know, one of the words that we use when we talk about these dynamics nationally or when we talk about them even in the context of the church recently one of the words we use is polarized, right? Or that things are polarizing. That's just one of those words that's kind of entered our, our vernacular, our, our common kind of uh, lexicon. But if you think about the, the, the kind of the origin of it, what, why do we use that particular word? Of course, it, it has to do with the idea of poles and magnets, right? That things either draw toward one another or push toward one another based on these invisible forces of polarity. And I don't know about your experience, but my experience in the church has been that often in individual churches like ours, and definitely in the broader church, our experience of being the body of Christ can feel a little bit like being a box of magnets. <laughs> what I mean by that is if you have a box of magnets and you open it up, what you will see is that some of them naturally clump together and in fact are quite difficult to separate. 
But then there are going to be other magnets in that box that are not already clumped together that if you take them and start to try to attach them to, an, to one another, what happens? They're fine, a little distance apart, but as they get closer, especially as you try to force them together, you know, you're coming up here and it's like the magnets are just like, no, thank you. I don't think I would like to be connected to that. And they will just kind of move around. It takes a lot of force to push them together. And then even if you do, what happens as soon as you let go? They will push back apart. And I think it's fair to say that not only in the world, but in the church, we often experience one another like that. We experience these kind of what, what at times feel invisible and almost unexplainable forces that either draw us to one another or push us from one another. And what I want you to see this morning in this text is that Paul is making a case that in the work of Christ, those push and pull dynamics, the polarities that we experience, get reoriented by what Christ has done and is doing in and through the church. So I don't know if you remember this from learning about magnets as a, as a young kid, but of course the polarity of a magnet is not fixed. It's not necessarily permanent. There are certain things you can do to change the push and pull dynamics of a magnet. And one of them is you can take a small magnet and put it in the magnetic field of a much larger magnet and it will slowly change the polarity of this smaller magnet. Do you remember maybe seeing that in a, you know, elementary school science class or something? Ring a bell vaguely. If you went to Georgia Tech and I didn't explain that great, it, afterward, tell the people around you what I'm talking about. I Googled it to make sure my memory wasn't totally off. And the point that Paul is making here is that the work of Christ is that much larger magnet. And that when he begins to draw us into the magnetic field of his work, what we experience as the people of God is that our polarity gets adjusted. And all of a sudden, things that we used to push away from, mysteriously, we are now drawn to. And not only do we find that we are drawn to Christ, but miraculously even drawn to one another. The way that Paul talks about this is not talking about push and pull. It's certainly not about talking about polarity. The, the verbiage Paul uses in this text to talk about this, you may have picked up on it, is calling. There are two particular words that he repeats multiple times in this passage. We'll get to the, the most obvious one in a minute. But the way Paul talks about this is calling. This new pull that we experience in our lives is a calling that comes from God. Paul uses it here as both a verb and a noun. The verb is basically just like our verb for call. It has a very broad range of meanings. It could be, I, I, I'm calling this a Bible. I'm you know, calling you by name. I'm calling someone who's over there. But there's a noun version as well that's very specific that he uses here. And the idea of a calling, the noun version, is that it is an, an invitation to experience some special privilege and responsibility. That when Christ works in our lives, when we are reconciled to him, our calling, our, our invitation is this pull to experience this new special privilege and responsibility. And then in verses 4 through 6, Paul highlights for us, he gives kind of a digest here, a summary of what it is that we are called by and what it is we are called to. And in short, what he says we are called to is oneness. One, he actually uses the word unity, but the word he uses repetitively is one, seven times. One body, one spirit, one hope, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father. What we are called to is oneness. And what Paul does here in this string of ones, all these things that we are called to, is he basically works backwards from the main idea of this text uh, to, to its beginning. So as we go further into chapter 4 here in the coming weeks, you will see that the main idea of this section of Ephesians is that in Christ, God has created one body. That's the idea that he's going to flesh out in the following verses. But remember in, a, in math classes when you started getting into a little bit more advanced math, long multiplication and long division, it wasn't sufficient just to have the right answer. What did you have to do? You have to show your work. The teacher has to be able to work backwards to know how you got there. 
And in this little shorthand, in verses 4 through 6, Paul is showing the work of how we become one body. Start at the end. The way that we become one body is first that there is one God and Father who is over all and through all and in all. And he has sent one Lord, that is Jesus Christ. And in Christ, we have one faith, the one thing we put our faith in, one baptism. Doesn't matter what background we come from, born into a Christian family, not born into a Christian family, how we come to Christ, one baptism, one hope. And through Christ, we have been given one spirit, and that spirit indwells and gives life to but one body. That is how we become one body. This is not just a random list, things, a random list of things Paul is coming up with here. He's not saying, oh, what are all the things that Christians have in common? Let's just throw them out there. Any kind of order will work. What Paul is doing here is he is making a theological case for the unity of the body of Christ. And he does it in two ways primarily. One is he points out that God himself demonstrates for us unity and diversity. Did you notice that he highlights God the Father, Jesus our Lord, and the Holy Spirit? Three persons, one God, each that works in different unique ways in our salvation and in our relationship with God, and through whom we experience in various ways our one faith, our one baptism, our one hope, and our one body that we share. Paul is making a, a theological case here that just as there is one God who is three persons, there is one body made up of many people, made up of Jews and Gentiles, men and women, young and old, people in authority and people under authority. As he goes through the rest of the book, this is the case that he is making. And it is not the first time that he's made this case in the book. Just to highlight quickly, if we go all the way back to chapter 1, when Paul prays for the Ephesians in chapter 1, verse 17 and 18, listen to how similar this is. He prays that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give you the spirit of wisdom, all three persons of the Trinity, of revelation and the knowledge of him, having the eyes of your hearts enlightened, that you may know what is the hope to which he has called you. That this is one of the things that God uses to draw us to himself and also to draw us to one another is a distinct Christian hope. That when it feels like the world is polarizing, fracturing, splintering, and when it feels like those fractures and polarizations are entering the church and that we are being pulled apart by forces that are potentially overwhelming, that our distinct hope is that God has called us to himself and to one another. Notice here the verbiage that Paul uses in verse 3. When he talks about the unity we have, this bond that we have with one another, oftentimes in other contexts outside the church, when you hear people talk about unity, you will hear verbs like, we need to strive for unity, pursue unity, build unity, create unity. What does Paul say we ought to do? We need to be eager to maintain the unity of the Spirit and the bond of peace. What's he saying? In Christ, we are unified. We are one because of all the things he's about to list. This is not a unity we are creating. It's actually not even a unity that we can, we can temporarily work against it, but we can't ultimately deter it. It is a unity that exists because it has been given to us. And so what we are called to do is to, to maintain it to sustain hope in it, as he says in the beginning, to walk in a manner worthy of our calling. So what does that look like? What does it look like to be eager to maintain the unity that we have in Christ? Well, that's the hard part. <laughs> Did you see this list? It's a bit daunting. To walk in a manner worthy of the calling to which you've been called, how are we going to do that? with all humility and gentleness, patience, bearing with one another in love. Commentators will say that bearing with one another is probably a bit of a polite translation here. More common vernacular is probably something like putting up with each other, enduring one another in love. Notice that what Paul highlights here is really not about how we outwardly engage with one another, how we speak to one another, treat one another, 
Even more foundationally, kind of under the surface, what Paul is concerned with here is our hearts towards one another. In light of the unity that we already have in Christ, we therefore need even more humility, gentleness, patience, and long-suffering with one another. If we take assessment of the world around us, if we're willing to look at the voices that we listen to, not only inside the church, but outside the church, I think many of us have to admit that these are not virtues that we do a great job of fostering. That these are not natural inclinations for us, certainly, but there are also far too few influences in our lives that help us to nurture humility, gentleness, patience, and endurance with one another. If I can give you just a, a pastoral kind of word of caution, if you're someone who takes great interest in politics, since we're still kind of right on the cusp of this season, if you're someone who tends to align more with one political party than another, that is fine. But I would caution you to beware of the influences that speak into your mind and heart. Because it is all too easy when we are convinced that we are right, that we know what's best, that other people need to get on our agenda, that we would in some cases be better off without them, to do everything that is basically the opposite <laughs> of what Paul instructs us here. And politics, of course, is not the only realm in which this is true, but it is one that has been, of course, very much in our lives and will continue to be as we process the outcome of the election. To put a fine point on it, I think as we listen to the way that people are responding to the election, when we hear one side or the other demonize, mock, look down upon, say that they're giving up on some group of people, we need to run from that kind of thing. Because what Paul is telling us here in this passage is that as Christians, especially as it relates to the church, we do not have that liberty because there is a larger force at play in us and in the church, this calling that God has given us. How hard will this be to do? Well, if Paul is any indication, pretty hard. <laughs> pretty difficult, actually. It's not a coincidence that in verse 1 here, for the third time in this letter, Paul drops in a hint that he is writing from prison. Why does he keep doing that? Why does he keep reminding the Ephesians that he's in prison? It's not a guilt trip. He's not, you know, trying to rub it in his bad circumstances. No, the reason he's doing it is that the Ephesians likely know what he is in prison for, what got him there. Just to give you a very, very quick kind of flyover summary, we've mentioned this several times before, but in the book of Acts, it records the events of Paul's life, including up to the point that he probably wrote this letter from prison in Rome. And what got him into that prison is recorded in detail, especially in Acts 20 to 22. You can go read it later this afternoon. But just to give you a few high points, in, in Acts 20, Paul is in Ephesus with them for the last time, and he leaves. And do you know where he goes? He goes back to Jerusalem. Jerusalem is like command center for the early church. He's going back to the hub, so to speak. And he goes back there and he takes word of all the things that he's been doing on his missionary journeys. And it says the initial people who receive him, they're overjoyed. It says that he came, he related to them, to them the things God had done among the Gentiles. And when they heard it, they glorified God. But then he starts going about in Jerusalem and doing his thing. And then in Acts 21, I want you to listen to what happens. In Acts 21, it says Jews from Asia which is not the area we now think of as Asia, but actually the area where Ephesus was, modern-day Turkey, the area he had been ministering. So Jews that probably knew him from his time there, who are now in Jerusalem, they see Paul in the temple, and they stirred up the crowd and laid hands on them, crying out, men of Israel, that's fellow Jews, help. This is the man who is teaching everyone everywhere against the people, against the Jewish people and the law in this place, that is the temple. Moreover... He has brought Greeks, that is Gentiles, non-Jews, into the temple and defiled this holy place. For they had seen him with, look at this, who do they see him with? Trophimus, the Ephesian. 
someone else from Ephesus, a non-Jew, with him in the city, and they supposed Paul had brought him into the temple. And then all the city was stirred up, and the people ran together, and they seized Paul, and they dragged him out of the temple. And he almost dies right here in this mob, but he gets saved out of it at the last second, taken away, and then another amazing thing happens. He asked to speak to the people that were just trying to mob him. And it says a hush falls over them. He starts speaking to them in Hebrew. And he speaks to them and they listen to this whole story about his kind of Jewish pedigree, his background, his conversion, uh, all of this stuff. They're tracking with him the whole way until the end of verse, or chapter 22. Paul says that Jesus told him, go, I will send you far away to the Gentiles. And it says up to this word, they listened then they raised their voice and said, Away with such, fellow, with such a fellow from the earth, for he shall not be allowed to live. This was Paul's life for a number of years, fighting both Jew and Gentile alike to convince them of the unity that they had in Christ. And in the process, he had to be humble enough, gentle enough, patient enough, willing to bear with them long enough that ultimately, after the events of Acts 22, he would appeal to Caesar and be taken to prison in Rome and wait there, perhaps until his death. Paul was an amazing apostle. Many people came to Christ through his ministry, but if you ask many people who lived at the time of him, Jew and Gentile alike, what they probably knew him for most was the fact that he would not give up on this dang idea of Jews and Gentiles getting along. It's the thing that he just could not stop talking about. That he seemed to be willing to suffer for more than anything. But I want to be clear, I don't share this to say, look at how Paul suffered. Don't you feel bad that you don't suffer like that? The reason that Paul holds himself up as an example to the Ephesians is because Paul does not see himself as the ultimate example. Where did Paul learn to suffer like this? Paul learned to suffer like this from Jesus. He saw the suffering of Jesus to reconcile us to God. And it was only natural to him, only natural to suffer in the same way. That's why he often refers to his suffering in Christ. Why he even says here that he is a prisoner for the Lord Jesus. Think about it this way. When it is described in Acts 9, this radical conversion that Paul has, if you want to go back to the magnet analogy, Paul has a unique experience of being forced really, really close to the really, really big magnet. <laughs> and all of a sudden, everything that Paul used to be drawn to, he is now averse from. Everything about his background, his Jewish pedigree, everything that was important to him is not important anymore. And all of a sudden, everything that he used to hate, Gentiles, people who didn't think it was necessary to know God through the temple system, all of these things that he used to hate, he is now drawn to. And the rest of his life is defined by that polar shift that happens within him. And do you know what the good news of the gospel is? For every one of us who are in Christ, and for the church collectively as a whole, that is the exact same work that God is doing in and through us. You cannot know Christ without him doing this work in you. If he is in you, then the one God, the one Lord, the one spirit is doing this work to help you gradually more and more realize that you share one baptism, one faith, one hope, and one body with the rest of Christ. There is good news in the fact that we are called to something, being pulled to something that we actually cannot ultimately resist. In our own flesh, there will be times that we will be like those magnets that as they start to get close to one another, they just slip around, right? But gradually, the work that God is doing in and through his church and local churches here and the global church as a whole is that gradually our polarity is being shifted. And we are finding that we are being drawn to things and drawn to people that we otherwise never would have been. This should be a great encouragement. I don't know about you, but in my own discipline, I have not found that I am able to make myself more humble, more gentle, more patient, or more willing to bear with others in love. 
But God is able to do those things in and through us. He is able to enable us to maintain the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. Lord, we thank you that this is promised to us in your word, that we are reminded here this morning that the work of God, Father, Son, and Spirit continues in us. It is not over when we are united to you, but continues. And we continue to be drawn more and more to the things of you. Lord, we pray that as we even saw this morning, as we are reminded of our own baptisms, we are reminded that we're not just baptized into one local church, but into your family, your body throughout time and history. That what we share most importantly is one faith, and that in the face of all of the divisions and polarizations and fracturing that we experience, that we hold, we cling to one hope that belongs to our call. Well, we thank you that your call in our lives is more powerful than the things that seek to pull us apart. And we pray these things, that you would help us to believe these things. We pray this in your name. Amen.